Hello everybody, welcome back to the lecture on polymer science and processing. This week we will deal with the properties of polymers in solid state and we will first focus on amorphous materials. Before doing this, let me briefly recap where we stand in our lecture. So if I give you this overview that I showed you at the very beginning, now we said that at the end of the day we want to know how to process polymers into useful products and then we rationalize that in order to make a product we need to know the material properties for this we need to know the, um, the physics of polymers so how polymer chains move and then we need to know the chemistry of uh, polymer chains in order to know how we actually make the polymers so we have ticked this one off last week and the last two weeks actually we spent quite some effort on polymer physics so we learned why polymers do not mix so well how we can picture a chain in solution we discussed a little bit on how we can then characterize these things and now we can finally move to the realm of materials and we will discuss um, how these properties that we learned from individual chains and also from polymer chemistry a bit trans really translate into the material properties and if we do this what we can learn is for example what determines the, these very diverse mechanical properties of polymers. Now, if you think about polymers, this can be anything from a rubber ball, very soft and squishy, to a bulletproof vest, which is all but soft and squishy, but very tough and uh, fracture resistant. But what we will also learn is, um, or we will discuss about rubbers, and what we will realize or discuss on uh, is what we need to do to make a good rubber. So we see why it needs to be vulcanized to be any good and this will pretty much relate to how a ball bounces and how a rubber works. And then we will also discuss a little bit how a polymer can move in the material, which thermal characteristics we need to provide in order to make it move and so on and so forth. And again, the spaghetti model is somewhat useful because you can already see all these polymers are somewhat entangled together and this makes it of course very difficult for them to move independently. Okay, what we want to, go, to do today is first discuss a little bit tools or characterization methods that we can use to investigate bulk properties of materials. Now, if you remember from last week, we discussed quite a lot on how we can characterize individual polymer chains. And now, if you want, in a second set of characterization methods, we will see what we can do to characterize the full material. Once we have this, we will then discuss the special case of amorphous polymers, and I'll come to this in a second, and especially um, the thermal properties, and we will see that a very important characteristic of amorphous polymers is the class transition temperature. Okay, before we start, or as a start, let us briefly recap what we know about polymer chains and how we can picture them in a bulk material. Okay, so we already know from last week or from the last two weeks that a single polymer chain will like to curl up in um, well, a Gaussian coil or generally in a coil, uh, coil configuration. So we can picture now if we have a lot of polymers, they will all coil up and entangle, very similar to the picture I showed you with the spaghetti. So one polymer chain, second polymer chain, third polymer chain. This is how we can very coarsely picture typical polymers in the bulk. And this configuration we term amorphous. And amorphous means that there is no order in the polymer chains. Well, then since there is amorphous, then it doesn't take uh, um, a lot of detective work to already kind of rationalize that there must be a different state. And this is a semi-crystalline state. And here, we do have crystals of polymers. So we typically picture them as kind of small lamella structures. And because it's a semi-crystalline polymer and not a crystalline polymer, this material contains two different phases, one crystalline, and this is connected by an amorphous matrix. So this will look like this, and then maybe another chain here, and this has some more crystals, and so on. So it contains properties of both substance classes if you want. So this would be a semi-crystalline polymer. And then there's one more thing and this is a rubber or an elastomer. And this is an amorphous polymer 
that is loosely cross-linked to other amorphous polymers. And for the sake of completeness, there's one additional possibility for polymer chains to arrange, which is somewhat aligned, but not perfectly. And this is known as um, a liquid crystalline state. which is something I do not want to cover in this lecture for the lack of time. Now, just for completeness, this is also possible. What we want to discuss are these three kind of big classes, cross-linked amorphous polymers, pure amorphous polymers, and semi-crystalline polymers. Okay, so now this kind of brings us directly to the next question. Let's um, suppose again we work in a company and our competitor has a very uh, good new material. We already figured out how we can dissolve it, how we can uh, measure the molecular weight. We did some chemical analysis or spectroscopic investigations, as I discussed with you last week. Um, so we have kind of a good impression on what kind of monomers may be involved. And of course, some straightforward tests on uh, or what we could do to, to check a bit more the bulk properties of the material is, well, Let's put it the other way around. Another thing that we want to know are the bike properties. So is it an amorphous material? Is it a semi-crystalline material? Is it maybe a rubber? Well, it's probably easy to feel. So we want to see a, a look a little bit more into these materials. And in order to do this, there's two um, most widely used characterization methods. And this is, these I want to briefly discuss with you. The first one is X-ray diffraction or X-ray analysis. And I think most of you are at least somewhat familiar with this technique. It's actually conceptually very simple. We have an X-ray source. So this emits X-rays. And X-rays are very high energy electromagnetic waves that consequently can probe very small structures. So then we shine this or in this beam, we put our polymer, material, and then we observe how the material interacts with these x-rays via a large screen that is placed right behind it. And now possibly these beams can somewhat interact and then we can detect this on the screen. And what we hope to see with this, or the kind of theory behind this, is that a crystalline material that has crystal layers, or crystal planes, maybe is the better word, will interact with X-rays by creating a constructive interference. And this constructive interference, we will see if a certain angle lambda is fulfilled, we will see as a signal, which is known as a reflex, on our screen. And this is then determined by Bragg's law. And lambda equals 2, um, 2d layer thickness times sine delta. Okay, so if we see a reflex, we can use Bragg's equation to back calculate how the crystal structure looks like or how thick the layer is and so on. So this is what, what um, X-ray diffraction is typically used in the investigation of crystalline materials. So now we can try to see how our possible substances convert into an X-ray pattern. And, and what we do is we look at the screen and see how our screen would look like. So if we put an amorphous polymer, into our X-ray beam, there is no crystallites, so there cannot be any constructive interference. So the only thing we can detect on the screen is what is known as a halo, and maybe 
can draw this here. So kind of a very weak, very broad smeared out ring. And if we now plot this as the x-ray intensity over the angle, called the delta, so if we kind of plot the intensity in this direction, we only see this halo. That's characteristic of the amorphous polymers. Okay, and this, the halo gives you, if you want, an average um, distance between polymer chains, but since they all move around and um, is not very defined, you get this very broad structure. Well, then we can probe a semi-crystalline material And in the semi-crystalline material, we do have crystallites. And these crystallites here cause constructive interference according to Bragg's law. And this then gives certain reflexes. So now, let me, if I put the screen here, I now let you think for a little bit how this would look like. Now, if we had a single crystal, all the X-rays would bounce in one direction and create a very defined point on the screen. What happens for a semi-crystalline material? Well, now if we look at our material here, let's assume this is our X-ray coming from one direction. So this crystal, crystal, which is oriented in this direction, may give a reflex that goes in this and this direction. Or well, let's just put four reflexes, let's say here and here and here and here. And now this crystal right here is rotated, so it will also create reflexes on the screen, but not in the same spatial direction as this one, simply because the crystal plane is rotated. So this may also create our X-ray pattern, but in this case, tilted. When I put it 90 degrees, this would be more 45, but you get the gist. This one is even tilted in a different direction, so if our X-ray beam comes, it will also create um, reflexes but again rotated. So let's say here and here and here and here and here. So overall, what you would get from a semi-crystalline material where you have a lot of individual crystallites that are not oriented would be rings. And often you see multiple rings, so kind of something like this. And if you plot the intensity again over the angle, then you will see your reflexes, but since this is also contains an amorphous part, you also get the signature of an amorphous halo. So this would be the halo, and here would be reflexes. And then we can already see that we can quantify the degree of crystallinity by taking the amount or the area of the peaks subtract the area of the halo and divide it by the total um, integral, the, the total area under the curve here. So we can actually use this to quantify the cation. So now, every now and then, if you take an X-ray of um, a polymeric material, you will actually see something like this. And if you plot it in the same direction, it will look like this. So we only have reflexes here. And now what I would like to know from you is what kind of a polymer material could that be? Think about it for a second. And think about what these reflexes or the individual, if you want, points here on our screen mean. So very similar to what I just discussed with you for the semi-crystalline materials, where each of these crystallites gives reflexes in a certain spatial direction, but because they're not aligned, it smears out and creates a ring. Here, apparently, we have a material where each of the crystallites also gives a certain reflex, but they are somewhat aligned and therefore do not smear out into a ring. And this is very typical for a polymer fiber. Because in a fiber, 
these semi-crystalline materials, or these, the domains, are stretched and all aligned in one direction. Maybe let me just put this in here. So this would be a polymer fiber. And why is that important? Because in a fiber, think about some whatever, um, a piece of string or a climbing rope and so on, you need to have very high mechanical strength in this direction along the fiber because this is how you pull a fiber. I mean, think about a climbing rope. You always fall down in a way that the rope stretches, but you never really uh, create any mechanical impact perpendicular to this direction. So for a fiber, you don't really care what's going on in this direction. All that counts is what happens in this direction. So you try to align these crystalline polymers by stretching during the synthesis, and this gives you strongly anisotropic mechanical properties, and you will see this in the XY defectogram here. Okay, so this would be the first possibility on how we can characterize amorphous polymers. Now you could argue, well, what happens if our X-ray machine is broken or if we don't have any X-rays? Is there not um, maybe a simpler possibility to do this? And indeed there is, and this is known as differential scanning calorimetry or DSC. And I just want to show this to you briefly on screen. So here again you see these different, this is a real world image of such a polymer fiber, so you see these individual reflexes here, and you see a little bit of the amorphous halo here as well, and in the semi-crystalline material you also see the amorphous halo, but you see very clear rings here. Okay, so now this is what we can see. So the DSC, the scanning uh, calorimetry, works as follows. We heat up a material, or we heat up the polymer, and we heat it up with respect to a reference sample. And what we measure is how much heat we need to put in compared to the reference. And this dH over dt, so how much heat at which temperature, allows us to probe phase transition in polymer materials. Because we know from phase transitions, whenever a material, let's say, melts or crystallizes, the enthalpy of that phase changes. And this can be seen in the DSC. So how does this work? We have a sample and a reference that are heated together. So in the machine, our sample here contains the polymer, and our reference doesn't contain anything, it's just an empty boat. Okay, so here this needs to be something that does not undergo any phase transitions. And then we have two heating coils here and temperature sensors. And what we ask the machine to heat it up, slowly increase the temperature and make sure that the temperature difference here is zero. And whenever a phase transition occurs, then this sample will either release heat, so the temperature here will rise, then we need to heat up more here, and we can record this to keep the temperature uh, different zero, or the phase transition is endothermic, so it will consume energy, and that means you need to put in more energy here compared to the reference, so we need to heat more here in order to maintain um, equal temperature between the samples. And this difference in heating, whether we need to put in more energy here or more energy here, can be recorded. So we record the temperature, we measure the differences in temperature, we, and we compensate them by extra energy or extra heat Q to the system. And that's our measurement signal. Okay, it's actually a fa fairly simple technique. So what we do, just do is heating up materials, and what we ask for is that two different, if you want, boats or, or pans are heated exactly at the same temperature. So now what do we get from this? Again, as we as um, the case for the X-rays, if the heat that needs to be put into the system changes upon phase transitions, we can of course explore phase transitions. And if you now again picture a semi-crystalline polymer, we clearly see that there's two different phases, now this amorphous phase and a semi-crystalline phase. So this now allows us to, to see more clearly what that means. And we already know for crystals, they have the tendency to melt when we heat them up, 
or to crystallize, of course, if we cool them down. So let's see how this translates into a DSC diagram. So here's our measurement signal. And what we record is the change in enthalpy over um, temperature. Sorry. dH over dt. And here we plot a difference in temperature. So now there is two possibilities that we have. For a semi-crystalline material, and it could also be an amorphous material. So in a semi-crystalline material, we detect a certain heat that we need, so not a, not a lot because it, uh, there is no phase transition and the reference sample heats up similar to our polymer sample. And then suddenly what we see is a drop here. And now I'm ex exaggerating this a little bit. Normally this is a very small peak. So suddenly, let me also specify that anything that points upwards is exothermic and anything that points downward is endothermic. So that means if our curve shifts to the bottom, we need to supply more energy to our polymer sample. If it shifts upwards, then it means the polymer sample releases heat or we need to supply less energy to the polymer sample or more to the reference. So first we have a drop here and then suddenly we get a big peak in this direction and then we get a peak in the endothermic direction and eventually the, it becomes hotter and hotter and the polymer starts to burn. So how can we rationalize this behavior? Let's start maybe with the um, very end. So here is simply combustion. Your, your sample thermally degrades, the polymer starts to burn, whatever that can release energy. So that's not something of interest because then once you go here, your sample is destroyed. Now, before that happens at relatively high temperatures, you have a peak that points downwards. So in the endothermic direction. And this we can associate with the melting of polymer crystallites. So this here is And why is this endothermic? Because a crystal lattice um, is an energetically very favorable state. This is why it, it actually forms. And to release that, you need to get rid of the energy or you need to overcome the energy that is saved in this lattice. So the lattice energy of the crystal. And this is why the peak is endothermic. Similar to ice, you need to heat it up in order to melt it. No, you need to supply energy for the molecules to get out of the crystal and to move in the liquid. Now, if you cool down from this polymer melt, then, um, or you cool down in this way, then eventually the polymer can start to crystallize. Now you, get, now you, you come from high temperatures, the polymer is, is melted, and as the temperature goes down, suddenly the material starts to crystallize, and this releases energy because now it forms a lattice, and this is known as the crystallization process. And then if we cool down more and more, suddenly we come to this weird kink here, where suddenly the polymer sample consumes less energy than before, but it doesn't really seem like a normal peak. It's more like a step. And this step is known as the class transition. And now this is... Um, a special property of amorphous polymers, or actually of amorphous materials, also occurs in normal glass, no window glass and so on. And this is something that we will dwell on a little bit more. So how will, it, will this look like for an amorphous polymer? And it's fairly 
Now clear what we, what we should anticipate, an amorphous polymer doesn't have any crystallites by definition, so it doesn't have a melting peak because the crystallites cannot melt, and it also doesn't have a crystallization peak because crystals do not form. So it will look very simple, kind of like this. And the only feature that we have here is the class transition temperature. Maybe one additional word to this, what you typically see in the semi-crystalline state is actually a hysteresis. So if you have an unknown sample, and you heat it up, then in the first heating run, you may not see a crystallization peak, but you only see a melting peak. So first run. And then when you cool down, so now you stop the machine and you hopefully stop it before it starts to burn, and you go back, then you only see a crystallization peak, but no melting peak. So my question for you at home is, why does this happen? Why do we observe this hysteresis? Think about this for one second, and in the meantime, I'll clean up. Okay, why is that? Well, the answer is actually fairly simple. If you have a material that is already semi-crystalline when you start, no, it looks like kind of, and so on. And you buy this or you get this whatever from your competitor and you investigate it. When you start from cold temperatures here, then you go over the glass transition temperature. As I said, bear with me for, for a second. But then there cannot be any crystallites forming because they are all already there. So you wouldn't see anything, but what you see is if you heat up more and more, they can certainly melt because they are there. Then when you are over this peak, you are in a state where now the crystals all have molten. And as you go back, you don't see this melting peak anymore because everything is already melted. And as you approach lower temperatures, these kind of liquid-like melted polymers can then reform into a crystal if they choose to do so, and this is something under which conditions that happens we will discuss next week in the next lecture, but then you will see a crystallization peak because now there's no crystals. And as you go here, then again you go over the class transition temperature and this is how you uh, get this hysteresis behavior. Okay, so now Maybe just clean up this as well, and we have more space. So how can we picture, let's put this here. 
So how can we rationalize or what is the class transition temperature? Well, the first thing that we note, if you, if you look back at these DSC curves that I showed you for amorphous polymers, if we don't see a crystallization or a melting peak, then strictly speaking, we can say that uh, an amorphous polymer cannot melt. No, because melting implies that it was in a crystalline state beforehand. So what happens if we heat up an amorphous polymer is we, we come from a hard state into a softer state and eventually into a really kind of viscous liquid state. But we do not really change any conformation. We don't have a crystal, so it cannot melt. Okay, that's maybe in counterintuitive, but a really important point to keep in mind, to remember, and also to kind of um, uh, rationalize in your head. No, it's uh, an amorphous polymer, if you want, is um, in a liquid state throughout um, at any temperature. And the same is actually true for glass. No, window glass or like SiO2, inorganic glass, is also a material that actually is a liquid from all definitions that we know, because it's not a solid, or it's not um, at least a crystalline solid, because it doesn't melt, it doesn't have a crystal structure. And that's one of the, um, if you want, big puzzles or like a, a, a very important consideration in the field of glasses, now how to really understand what that means for material. So for example, it is known from window glass in churches. If this is really, really old, then you see that it's thicker at the bottom than at the top. And this implies that at a very, very, very low time scale, it can actually flow. And flowing is a property of a liquid. The only question is how long it takes for these polymers to move. And this depends on the temperature and therefore also on the time if it's below the glass transition temperature. Okay, so how do we picture this? What does this mean? An amorphous polymer at um, very low temperatures consists of many coiled polymers. Okay, and these coiled polymers cannot move very efficiently because they don't have enough thermal energy to undergo movement. And eventually, as you heat them up more and more, you supply more and more energy to the system. And eventually, that means that you can start, or the thermal energy that is supplied to the system induces rotations of the individual polymer bonds. And then the polymer starts very slowly and steadily to rotate, to move around a little bit, to, no, to vibrate. So there's, it suddenly starts to become dynamic. And as it does so, it can then start to move more and more, and it means it will require more space. So kind of it, it expands a little bit because it can move, and this increases the free volume of the entire polymer material. Now think about it as a very simple picture. Think about snakes. Now snakes are unlike us. They don't keep their body temperature constant, but they keep the body temperature of the environment. So now if it starts to get cold outside, the snake suddenly doesn't feel able to move anymore because it's, it doesn't have enough thermal energy supplied to its system to, to move. So if you now think about a lot of polymers, no kind of a snake pit, uh, sorry, a lot of snakes, a snake pit, in winter they will all kind of freeze together and then stay in their entangled and kind of snaky way, but they will not move too much. And this you can picture as the classy state of a polymer below the class transition temperature. All entangled, randomly, like unordered chains or snakes that cannot move because there's not enough energy available. Now you heat up, and that is in our snake analogy, is when spring finally comes, the sun shines, and the snakes, the snakes at the top of the snake pit get exposed to sun, they heat up, and then they feel they get energy to move. So they start to wiggle around. And slowly but steadily, all the snakes start to wiggle around. The whole snake pit expands a little bit because the snakes now move much more. And now they're the dynamic. So now individual snakes can crawl out. The whole thing becomes very dynamic and it can flow away if you want. No, the snakes can crawl away. Very same thing for polymers. Up, uh, upon a certain temperature, they can start to move. And that means they can move much more and the material becomes much softer. Okay, that's kind of the rationale behind um, the class transition temperature or amorphous polymers. So if you want to picture this in a simple diagram, so if we look at the free volume, we can plot the free volume Vf as a function of temperature T, and for a crystal, what we know is that the free volume expands a little bit because bond vibrations start to move. 
and then eventually we have a melting and upon this melting the free volume rapidly becomes much larger and then is in a liquid state. And of course the liquid state also expands as we increase the temperature because there's more uh, brown in motion or there's more thermal motion and that expands the polymer. So for an amorphous material, now we, since we don't have a melting, if we cool down, it will cool, cool down more and more. Now we overgo this, or we, we do not consider this melting peak, but suddenly the free volume changes. And that is well, the slope of the free volume changes and it becomes much less dependent on the free volume. And this is again because the polymers suddenly cannot move anymore, so they cannot keep their distance and then they freeze in a certain position. And now the important thing about a class transition temperature, it depends on the rate of heating or cooling. So let's say this would be for, for fast cooling. And if you cool slower, it actually takes some more time. Now, let me exaggerate a little bit. And then you also go into this different plateau, but first of all, at a different temperature, and secondly, at a different free volume. And that means that unlike a normal, if you want, melting transition, the class transition temperature really depends on the um, thermal history of your material. So how fast you cool down as compared to um, a melting, which always occurs at the same temperature. No? Because it's, it's a um, first order phase transition that is given by thermodynamic considerations. So now what does this, or why is that? Well, think again about the snakes. If you, um, you have snakes that are very dynamic, so polymers at high temperatures here, they move around and now the sun sets and the snakes become slower and slower and eventually cannot move anymore. That's what we do if we cool down. Now if the sun sets very fast or if you whatever switch off the heating, then all the snakes will very suddenly start to freeze or maybe even better you whatever, pour hot water onto the, uh, cold water onto them. So they will very quickly stop moving and will freeze into the last position they were in. So there's no way for the system to equilibrate um, uh, very um, efficiently. And that means that the free volume is still relatively high because the chains couldn't really pack very efficiently. But in contrast, if you know, cool down slower and slower and slower, then the snakes or the polymer chains have more and more time to move around as they become colder and then they can become closer and closer, thereby minimizing the free volume and eventually also freezing. Okay? So the change in, in free volume tells us that there is a difference between melting and the class transition temperature and that the class transition temperature depends on the cooling rate. And both is related to a change in polymer dynamics. And a very strong change at that. and maybe we say polymer chain dynamics. That's not true for a melting point. Now there you really get a different conformation. Okay, so gets, now let's look a little bit more into these thermodynamics of the class transition temperature. And maybe I'll show this to you briefly on the slides and then we go into the evaluation of that. So again, this is what we discussed. So here you see this free volume plot and we have below the class transition temperature, the polymers are frozen in their configuration so they can, cannot move or move only a little bit and it has a nearly constant and very small free volume. And above the class transition temperature, the snakes really wake up, the polymer chains obtain enough thermal energy to move and rotate along their chains. This gives them more free volume because each chain can make more space. And that means that the material becomes much more rubbery and much softer. Okay, so we see this here as well. So now let's look at these phase transitions. If we have a first order phase transition, this is phase transitions that we know. They typically consist of a crystal, let's say 
looks like this, melting up and then completely changes the configuration. So really the entire physical configuration of the material changes. And this always relates to a big change in volume. Now you see this if you think about um, evaporation, for example, a liquid becoming um, a vapor increases very, very drastically in volume. But it also changes in, in entropy and in entropy. And entropy is maybe best seen in a melting process where you have a very ordered state before and a disordered state afterwards. Okay, so much more microstates in this case as compared to this case above the melting. However, for a class transition temperature, there is actually no change in physical configuration. If you take a picture of the individual polymer chains above and below the class transition, it will look exactly the same. Both are very kind of randomly packed and you don't really see at first glance or at um, a still frame whether the material is dynamic or not. So what changes is not the physical configuration, but what changes is the dynamics of movement. So below the class transition temperature, you have a polymer chain that is somewhat frozen. And above, this frozen state starts to move around no? because you have enough thermal energy. But you don't get a physical change in properties. So now let's look how we can rationalize this a little bit more and also explain why normal phase transitions are called first order phase transitions, while this class transition temperature is a second order phase transition. So why does a phase transition occur? I mean, that's quite clear because we have a change in free energy. So we have our free energy here over temperature. And we have the free energy of a melt. And we have the free energy, let's say, of a crystal. And they both, of course, change with temperature because of this delta H minus T delta S. But at the, they change at different rates. And at a certain point here, below this temperature, the crystal has the lower energy. So the system sits in a crystalline state. Above this temperature, which we call melting, suddenly the melt is in a lower state. And that means um, that the system will melt. So what does this mean for for the different physical properties. So we can look at, for example, the volume or the enthalpy or the entropy. Let's just look for, this, for the sake of simplicity. Let's look at the entropy, but we already discussed this. Here's the melting point. So in the beginning, in the crystalline state, we have a low increase in entropy or also in volume, which is nearly constant, but of course it increases a little bit because of um, increased thermal motion of the atoms that either expand the volume a little bit, no, this is normal thermal expansion, or in case of entropy, it just increases vibrational decrease of entropy. But now if we go over this melting point, we go into a completely different state, namely the liquid state. And the liquid state has both a much higher volume and also a much higher entropy, because now the molecules can freely rotate, can move around, and so on. So much is, is much more disordered, or more professionally speaking, has a much higher number of microstates, and of course the volume also expands. So we have um, a step change here in these properties. And now as it happens, and that's not something that I um, think most of you know, but or that you don't really need to know at the moment, but if you look at thermodynamics, or at a general yeah, theory of thermodynamics, then you will see that these properties here are all first derivative of the free energy. 
And just as examples, so for example, dg over dp at constant temperature is the volume, or the entropy would be dg over dt at constant pressure, I think. Now, this comes from, from, from these general thermodynamic functions. And you see that whenever you, um, you um, differentiate the free energy with respect to one variable, keep something as different, then you get these, um, uh, uh, these properties, volume, temperature, uh, sorry, volume, entropy, and so on and so forth. OK, and now you can also plot something different here, t over g. And what we will plot here is, for example, so not g, alpha thermal expansion coefficient, Cp, um, the um, heat capacity of the material, or kappa, so thermal conductivity. And these are properties that are the derivatives of volume, entropy, and so on. So these are the second derivatives of the free energy. And I'll show this to you on the slide in a second. So all of these are Maybe as one example, just ds over dt at a constant pressure is Cp, heat capacity over temperature. OK, that's not something that, that we need to know uh, now. But generally, these properties relate to first derivatives with respect to volume, entropy, and so on. So our second der derivatives with respect to g. And they are constant in a state. And now if this state changes, Think about, let's say, a crystal um, versus a liquid. And the liquid can take up much more, um, uh, much more temperature or has a higher thermal uh, conductivity because it can move much more. OK, so here, again, we have our melting point. And we see also this has a step change. So it's not a continuous function. So why am I talking about all these things all the time? And you can already, already guess. This here are first order phase transitions. And first order, because the first derivative of the free energy changes non uh, discontinuously so you have a step change in these properties now that's the key maybe let's underline this here in red and this would be so now let's look at the class transition temperature and i already told you this is a second order phase transition And let's see how, how this will look like. So again, in, at the free energy level, nothing too much changes. G over T We look fairly similar. The only difference is that the crossing here is a bit smoother. So we also have a melt. And we have a crystal. And we have a bit of a smoother transition. For example, GG. And with smooth, smoother, I mean they have the same slope in, at this um, uh, transition temperature. So now, how about these properties here? So all these first derivatives of the free energy for the class transition temperature or a second order phase transition, they do not change. Well, they do not change um, discontinuously. So, Let's again look at, let's say, the volume of our sample. 
below the, the class transition, we have a very low volume because the material is classy and it's nearly constant. It changes a little bit because with increasing temperature, we get slightly more vibrations in the bonds. So everything can expand a little bit. But as we now come over the class transition, right at this temperature, actually nothing changes. But now the class transition is the point where the polymer chains, if you want, wake up and start to rotate around. So slowly but steadily, the volume expands as more and more polymer chains start to move, also more and more, as we go over the class transition. So here we have a change in slope, possibly a quite drastic change in slope, but still no step change. Now here is still a continuous function, Tg. This is the Tg here. And the same is true for, let's say, the entropy of the system. In the beginning, it's fairly, fairly low at low temperatures because everything is arrested in a certain state. And of course, we have different numbers of microstates and so on, but there's not much that the system can do to, to move around. And as the temperature increases, the polymer chains start to move. So you probe much more microstates because now the molecules can rotate around and adopt different conformations. And that increases the entropy. But again, not discontinuously because there's not a rapid increase from one state to the other, but more like a smooth transition into more and more movement. But now, if I look at these functions here, the second deri derivatives of G, so alpha, Cp, kappa, and so on, over temperature. So let's look, for example, at the heat capacity. So how much um, heat or how much, um, yeah, uh, thermal energy can be stored in a material in the amorphous state below the class transition temperature. If you supply heat, the material can actually not really do anything with it because it, it cannot store it efficiently. But as you approach the class transition temperature, as you go over the class transition, suddenly all the heat or a lot of the heat that you supply to the system is converted into motion of the polymer chains. So here now you really have a stepwise change because at the class transition you start to be able to couple in heat efficiently because it converts into motion. So this will look like this. Tg. So now to keep it consistent I can draw this like this. And here now we have our stepwise change in properties. And you can see that again these things here are the second derivatives of the free energy, and this is why we call it a second order phase transition. Okay, so it's a bit less intuitive, but you see it's a phase transition nevertheless, just with different characteristics. And then from day, daily life, we have just much more experience with something like this because we frequently observe ice melting and water boiling and so on, but there's quite some examples of such second order phase transitions as well. Um, if you want, hit pause and think about if you can, can uh, find another second order phase transition that you maybe know of. And if not, I'm just going to spoil it. If you think about a magnet, magnets are only magnetic until a certain temperature. If you go above this temperature, or the Curie or Neel temperature, then you lose your magnetization because the spins can, or it's not energetically favorable anymore to align the spins. And that's exactly the same thing. If you just look at the magnet itself, all the atoms are still in their lattice position, so at first glance it will look exactly the same whether you're above or below this uh, phase transition temperature. But if you look at the magnetization, so the kind of a property arising somewhat from the crystal structures, which is also something like this here, then you see a step change because either it's magnetic or not. So it's also something that is somewhat kind of a property that comes after the crystal structure. No, you don't really see it in the crystal structure whether it's magnetic or not because it's just the spin of the electrons that aligns. So you see this is actually a, um, something that, that occurs and that you can observe more or less frequently and it's the very same thing for the class transition temperature. Okay, let's see. Where are we? So this is exactly what we had on the blackboard. Here we see these uh, the thermodynamic investigations of these class transition temperature. And just to show you examples, so this is um, DSC data, differential scanning calorimetry of um, different polymers, polystyrene, no polycarbonate, and polyether um, sulfone. 
And first of all, what we observe is that these curves actually look fairly, pretty much as I drew them on the blackboard. So we have this kink, and the kink goes down into the endothermic way. So the, from here on, the polymer consumes more energy as compared to here. That's the first um, observation. And secondly, we see that it depends on the polymers where this transition occurs. Now, this one here has a very high class transition temperature, roughly whatever, 230 or so. Polycarbonate uh, here has roughly 100, whatever, 40 or so. And polystyrene is round about at 100. So what we want to do now is first understand why this peak is endotherm, endothermic, and then see why these different polymers have different class transition temperatures. So why is it endothermic? Now remember where the signal comes from. We heat up our polymer sample with respect, or we can compare it to a reference that doesn't undergo a phase transition. At very low temperatures, you supply heat, but the polymers do not really change. Nothing is happening, so it heats up similarly to your reference. As we come to the class transition temperature, suddenly our thermal energy, our heat, is used to make the polymer chains move. So you consume energy that is not directly converted into heating the sample, which doesn't happen at the reference. And this is why suddenly you need to supply more energy to your polymer material as to your empty reference. And it also doesn't recover anymore. No, it's not a peak or a dip that goes up again. Because as you increase the temperature, more and more heat is converted into thermal motion of the polymer. So actually this is something that keeps going on and on and on as long as you're above the glass transition temperature. And this is why we don't have a peak, but a step in our DSC profile. Okay, so last puzzle to solve is how come these different polymers have different glass transition temperatures? So this is also something I would like to discuss on the blackboard. So what is the influence of different factors on the class transition temperature? And in order to discuss this, I will give you three polymers, and we will try to sort them according to class temperature. So first example is we will look at polyethylene. And we will look at polystyrene. And then we will look at polynaphthalene, where we just put another benzene ring onto this benzene ring here. And now, my question is, which of these polymers has the lowest and which one has the highest class transition temperature and why? So take a second to think about this. No, and discuss for yourself what could be the reason or how the class transition temperature could be modified by these things. Well, the first question to ask is how, well, the first thing to note is that these polymers are all hydrocarbon chains here, and the difference is in the side group. That's the first thing to note. Now, the second thing is, or the second question to ask is, how do these side groups here affect the movement of the polymer chain. Because the class transition temperature is nothing but a yardstick on how easy it is for the polymers to move, or how much ener energy you need to supply to allow them to move. So we note that this is a benzene ring, which is a very rigid and big structure. These are two benzene rings, which kind of logically are more rigid and more difficult to move. So in a very simple picture, you can, you can picture these two polymers as uh, snakes that wear really big um, uh, backpacks, or maybe whatever, have a house as uh, like a snail. And this backpack, of course, hinders them in their movement. 
because now they are substantially bigger, no? and these are everywhere here, and it's more difficult to move for them. So it requires more energy to move. So we would predict that with bulky substit substituents, it will be more difficult to move, and that means they should have a higher glass transition temperature. And indeed, if we look at the TG, which I'm going to just write here, this is 188 Kelvin, so very low for polyethylene, reflecting that there is no hindrance of rotation. Polystyrene has 373 Kelvin, so 100 degree C. And polynaphthalene has 400 8 Kelvin. So clearly you see, as we predicted, you increase the temperature with bulky substituents. Um, and now let me just already summarize this here. Oh, hang on. What we're going to do is we clean up some space at the bottom and then we can work on our summary already here. So let's note down here. Bulky or rigid side groups. They hinder rotation and thereby increase the class transition temperature. And that means the class transition temperature goes up. Okay, next example. Now we will compare polypropylene and we compare this with polyvinyl chloride. and with polyacrylonitrile. And as before, I invite all of you to now think about how the glass transition temperature changes for these three polymers. Well, just as a short recap, polypropylene is something we, we, we use to make typical plastic parts. Polyvinyl chloride is something that we use, for example, to make a scratch-resistant floor uh, materials. Um, um, uh, Schallplatten, um, vinyl discs, vinyl recordings, and um, these polyacrylonitrile um, is something that is used to make carbon fibers which is something that I can show you in one of the exercises. Okay, so polymers we, we find in everyday life, and now how is the class transition temperature for them? Now again, the first thing to, to observe is they all have side groups, and now we need to figure out what is the difference between their side groups. Well, what we, what we can imagine is that it changes in polarity. This one is an unpolar side group. The chloride is fairly polar and also somewhat polarizable because it's a fairly um, large atom, so the electrons can fairly easily shift around. And this one is very polar, 
because it has um, a carbon that is in direct vicinity to a nitrogen, which is much more electronegative. So it draws all the electrons to the nitrogen chain. So what we would expect is that such a group has a dipole moment. And this dipole moment looks kind of like this, plus and minus. And the second polymer chain that now comes close by has exactly the same side groups, also a plus and a minus, and a plus and a minus here. So you can see that because of these dipoles, they can somewhat electrostatically stick together you know, by aligning their dipoles in opposite directions. So now the second question, and this is somewhat true for the chloride as well, because it's also uh, polarizable. So now the next question to ask is how will this influence the movability or the, the possibility to, for the polymer chains to move around? And clearly, if you have such a group, then the polymers will not move so easily because they tend to stick together. So our a kind of prediction would be that the glass transition temperature increases as you go down from here. And indeed, what you see is polypropylene has a Tg of 353 Kelvin, so below room temperature, so it's fairly, a fairly soft material. This one here, PVC, has 34 uh, 354 Kelvin, so it's higher, and this one has 378 Kelvin, so indeed the glass transition temperature increases as we move to the bottom. So what do we learn from this? By case side groups, we have ticked off. Polar side groups, They build dipoles. And dipoles hinder the chain movement because they stick together. Well, dipoles increase, let's say, interactions. Now this is the sticking together. If they increase interaction, it also hinders the movement or hinders rotation. And therefore, the class transition temperature goes up. OK, next example. Now let's consider the following. We compare polypropylene again. And now we increase the chain length of this one here. So we compare it to polybutylene. And let me just draw it. One, one, two, three. And just as a second example, we can also do the same thing on an acrylate basis, so we can compare PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, with a methyl group here, to exactly the same structure, but one that has one, two, three, Four, four chains. So you see the situation is identical. We always increase the length of the side group, either one directly to the main chain or via this accurate moiety. And again, as before, my question to you is what happens? Now the first question to ask is what changes? We discussed this already. The side group or the length of the side group changes. Now, intuitively, we would be tempted to say, well, this is somewhat the same as here. So it should increase because the 
the side group gets larger. But there's one notable difference between the benzene ring that we put here and a CH4 or a C4 chain, an acyl chain. This one is very rigid, so think about the backpack. This one is very soft. And soft means that it can move around and rotate and so on. And matter of factly, what happens if you have a polymer that has a lot of these small side chains? They will act as little spacers, little flexible spacers to keep the other polymer chains a little bit at bay. And that means that for the polymer chain in the middle, it's easier to move. So this one here, we can picture, we compare these two polymer chains that need to move with something that has small hairs here. that keeps the second polymer chain at a larger distance. So a flexible side chain actually decreases the class transition temperature because it acts as a flexible spacer. Okay, and just to show you that this indeed is correct, I give you, so this one we already know, this is 353 Kelvin. Now if we make the chain longer, we go to 223 Kelvin. So you see it decreases by uh, 30 degrees and here, very similarly, M, uh, uh, PMMA has 279 Kelvin, and this one here has 218. So you see actually a fairly significant effect by the introduction of flexible side chains. So we summarize here. Flexible side groups or side chains. So what do they do? They increase free volume because they act as a spacer. And when ca one can also picture that, that they act as a local solvent for the polymer chain. No, because it's the same material, so it makes them much more flexible. Let me put this in like this. And both of these effects increase flexibility. And if the flexibility is increased, it's easier for the polymer chain to move. And that means that the TG goes down. OK, so last example I want to discuss with you is now what happens if we change something in the main chain. And for this, we compare four different polymers. One, a bit of a special type. This is silicone. So an inorganic polymer, and we will discuss in a second what the speciality here is. By the way, I forgot these ends here everywhere. We can compare this to a normal polyethylene. And then we, can, uh, we compare to some more rigid. Oh, let me just give you one example for, for instruction. We add an aromatic unit to the backbone. So what changes here? Now again, the question to ask is, how do our polymer change? And how does this affect the mobility of the polymer chain? I think a fairly easy point to do is, this we already discussed is fairly flexible. If we put something rigid and inflexible into the backbone, we would expect that the class transition temperature goes up because it's more difficult for the polymers to move. And that's exactly what, uh, what happens. Need to put up the numbers. So this one here was 188 Kelvin, and this here is 553 Kelvin. So you see, it's a huge dramatic difference if you add aromatic groups into the main chain 
for the chain mobility. Makes sense, no? because it becomes much stiffer. Now let me show you that this one here only has a class transition temperature of 150K. And this may come surprising because we have an oxygen atom in here, which is polar. And one, one may think that this actually increases the affinity to other chains, the interactions, and makes the material stiffer. However, kind of from our intuition, we already know that silicones are very flexible materials. Now, if you go to your kitchen and look at one of these more modern baking forms, you see it's very squishy and flexible. This is silicone. That's this material. But why is it? What, what is the interesting or the phenomenon that causes this uh, material to be so flexible? Well, and the answer is that the silicon atom is fairly large, so the bond length here is larger, and that makes it very easy for this molecule to rotate. Also, the oxygen doesn't have any, any hydrogens next to it. No, here is also a hydrogen atom, so this is a very kind of smooth gear that can rotate fairly freely. And if you have easy rotation in your chain, then of course automatically it increases your mobility very drastically. And this makes silicon so special because it retains a very high flexibility in this inorganic backbone. So here we can then say main chain and now we put it up here so we have everything together. Let me just call it flexible bonds, increase. Rotation or maybe facilitate rotation. Hence, the class transition temperature goes down. And conversely, rigid, let me call it rigid elements because a benzene ring is not technically not, not a bond, but you know what I mean. decrease rotation or decrease the capability to rotate and therefore Tg goes up. So here now from this kind of excerpt into polymer chemistry again, we have kind of our guidelines what we need to do to change the class transition temperature of a polymer. Okay, so now what I want to do with you is first clean the blackboard and now as a last point we should briefly discuss how this translates into macroscopic properties of the material. Now, what's the difference between a polystyrene and maybe a silicone rubber? And I mean, all of you know already that we use them in very different locations and that the mechanical properties change. But I now want to demonstrate to you how that actually is. So for this, we planned a little experiment. And Reza can assist me with this experiment. So what I'm going to do now is show you how the properties of material changes or change with temperature. And for this, I brought to you liquid nitrogen, you know, something that's very cold, and then we will see how we can influence the properties of a material. So what we start with is a rubber. And you see, maybe Reza can zoom in a bit, you see that the rubber can very easily be stretched. 
I think this is how it's clearest to see. Okay, now I put the rubber into the liquid nitrogen. And I do it in a way that you can actually observe it. So you hear some bubbling noise. This is as the rubber cools down. This will take a little bit. So now I take it out. And you see, this is again the rubber. And it's very brittle. Now, it, well, now it's warm again. But you saw that it's much more difficult to stretch it as before. And I can just do it again once more to, to show you more thoroughly. So again, you see, breaks apart very easily. So you see that this very soft elastic material suddenly becomes very hard and brittle. And now to show you something even more maybe exciting, I take this rubber ball, and maybe Reza, you can zoom out, and I show you how this rubber ball bounces. I mean, I guess everybody knows how a rubber ball bounces. And now I put this rubber ball in here as well. Now this will take some time to cool down. So now as I take this out, you can already see the smoke coming out here. Or you see how cold it is. And you see it even sticks to these tweezers here. And now I drop it down. And we see how it will bounce. Huh. OK, surprisingly, it actually bounces fairly well. But now it's broken. And you, you hear from the sound, Yeah, you see that the energy dissipates much worse. Okay, I mean, very clear difference. And now last example, a tennis ball that you know bounces very well as well. This one I just drop in here and leave it in here for some time. And I'm not sure if you can hear this. But it already sounds very different. Now in this one I will take out with the big glove if I, if I manage to. Actually not. Not so. Okay, easy. So now a very cool tennis ball. And again, you see how it trips off the nitrogen and so on. And you hear very clearly that this is not really good for a watcher Federer to play anymore. No, it's very hard, very tacky, and you see that it lost all of its elasticity. Okay, with this, um, I leave you to ponder about the tennis balls. By the way, this looks very cool. And we will discuss elasticity a bit more um, in the next lecture. And what I want to do now is just very briefly recap what we learned in this lecture. So this is what we went through again before. So molecular pictures and consequences. In the classy state of an amorphous material, if we apply heat 
we don't really do a lot. So there's a little bit of movement along the equilibrium positions, but the positions of the molecule is frozen. While if we heat up, then suddenly we become very large segmental motions between fixed entanglements. So you see that these can now move very freely. What does this mean for the deformation mechanism? If I pull, you've seen this on the tennis ball and on the rubber. Here I can hardly pull anything. And the little pull I can do is to change the valence angles of the individual bonds. However, here I can actually uncoil and orient the entire segment. So now I really have a huge possibility to move the material because this segment here is now flexible. No, but the entanglements remain fixed, so it doesn't fall apart directly. And what is the macroscopic effect? That's what we've seen in the classy state after it comes out of the liquid nitrogen. It's very hard, it has a high modulus. You cannot really stretch it anymore, very small elongation, and what you deform is elastic. Okay, and here you have a very low modulus, so it's very easy to pull on it. You can pull for quite some time, so you can really extend it a lot. And the deformation is, um, I put it in practical elastic, that depends on whether it's crossing or not. So if you keep it stretched and it's not crossing, it will start to flow because it's actually viscoelastic. Okay, and now if you heat up more and more, then eventually in the melt, also this entanglement starts to disentangle. So you have a continuous disentanglement and entanglement of the molecules. So the polymer chains move much more, and that means it can really flow apart. No, in, the, in this rubber elastic state, the entanglements still keep somewhat preserved its shape. And as you do more and more, it can move more and more. Then it can uncoil and stretch, and that means it really flows uh, in a viscous way. So with this, let's briefly wrap up. Amorphous polymers, the important thing is the class transition temperature, and we've seen how this plays out on the molecular level. We also seen that the class transition temperature really crucially depends on the molecular architecture of the chain. And something I did not discuss, I just want to mention this because we need it next week, amorphous polymers can be transparent, okay, because they con contain a single phase. And this will be important, as I said, next week. So thank you very much for joining, and um, I hope to see you again next week. Stay healthy and safe. Goodbye.